Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. All kinds of neat stuff to get into today. Stacy. Well, you might notice that we are back in the United States of America, where it is a little bit colder than El Salvador. Everybody in the comments and online and around the world is loving the interview with Dr. Felix Ulloa, who is the vice president of El Salvador. And it's uh, you could tell he's like a really thoughtful, compassionate man and with a very fascinating background and history and story and an understanding of the people and the history of El Salvador. So it's been really uh, wonderful to watch that interview with him. Oh, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, speaking with the vice president. He's got a broad uh, knowledge of things. He's a very educated man, cultured man. Uh, off camera, we're talking about Paris and Europe and things like that, which I thought was fascinating. I hope to speak with him again sometime. The thing I want to bring up about him, because he talks about the assassination of his father, which happened in 1980. And 1980 was quite a pivotal year in El Salvador. It was at the beginning of 1980 when we had the Archbishop Oscar Romero publish a letter in the New York Times pleading with the American people and government to stop funding the military who were massacring peasants and stuff like that. Within two months, he was assassinated and then followed a year of just all sorts of assassinations the uh, rape and murder of the nuns and uh, the American nuns by December. So 1980 was a pivotal year. That was also the year in which his father was assassinated. And it made me think of just like the context of today as the U.S. mainstream media talks about El Salvador, talks about the president as if there is no history there, as if it's just like a guy like plucked out of the blue right there and installed today. Like that there's no context to the history of U.S. involvement there, of the past of which we were involved. Of all the various uh, occupations and uh, in interferences with uh, various governments uh, for the past 50, 60 years, the American interference in El Salvador is particularly stunning and horrific. And I think that the Americans would have loved to have just swept that under the rug and forget about it. But two things happened. One, social media. Uh, then we had President Bukele come into office. He's incredibly vibrant and young, and uh, he made Bitcoin legal tender, uh, which is as some call it, even the cover of one of the major periodicals a couple of years ago, they referred to Bitcoin as the truth machine. Essentially, Bitcoin reveals the truth, uh, even truths that everyone would love to see hidden and forgotten. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, an ongoing process, and uh, it's going to be true around the world, and we see it happening elsewhere uh, in other countries. But this is really stunning what's going on. Exactly. Back to El Salvador, I wanted to point out that there was a quote that Jack Dorsey recently gave from William Gibson when he was interviewed by Michael Saylor. And he's, the, the quote is that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And he was talking about El Salvador and that the future is here and it's El Salvador. And this is uh, one thing that also makes me think of today and the context of our history and our shared history, because all humans, we have a shared history. But in the United States and El Salvador, we have a uniquely, um, some might say, disturbing history, right? But so El Salvador had been run, and still to this day, there's a remnants of it, this, the, the Catorce, uh, Las Catorce, the, the 14 families. And in the United States, a lot of our problems also come from uh, Los Doce, the 12 Fed banks. So the 14 families or the 12 banks, they control distribution of wealth. And what happens is that they do it in conspiracy. They form a cartel of 14 families. They form like secret meetings of FOMC meetings to determine and conspire the price of money or how much wealth they're willing to distribute. And what we always then see, especially in the history of Latin America, is a redistribution, like the people rise up and they want a redistribution. So what Bitcoin has offered is a plan B, like we don't need to have these cycles of 
revolution, civil war, revolution, civil war, consolidation and conspiracy, you know, of power and wealth and things like that. We just can have an open ledger where consensus is reached, not conspiracy and not any sort of violent revolution. Right. Like I say often, Bitcoin is on its own vector, right? So that vector is going in a direction that is not obeying the classic two-party system or the classic mm. cartels, whether it's the 14 families in El Salvador or the 12 member banks of the central banking system here in the U.S. or any of the other uh, cartels and power cartels. Uh, it's on its own vector. It's going in its own direction. And it exposes a lot of these cartels. And I think what we're seeing in, in Canada, for example, is the result of these money printing central banks have destroyed society. Uh, and uh, without Bitcoin, it wouldn't be obvious. But when you have something like Bitcoin, it's uh, suddenly obvious. Uh, the abuse that's taking place by these central banks. And when something becomes so obvious like that, the people uh, will will rise up. And we're seeing that in Canada, but we've saw this with Occupy Wall Street. We saw this with the Gilets Jaunes in France uh, and these other groups around the world. We call it the global insurrection against banker occupation. And that's just been exacerbated and accelerated with the domination now of Bitcoin. Right. President Bukele said something once, which sticks with me to this day. I say it all the time and I repeat it. And he said, where we are going is to the place we want to be. That is what he has set in motion with this Bitcoin law. We want to be in a place where there is not this pattern of consolidation of wealth and hoarding of wealth and conspiracy against the people. And then a revolution, a bloody revolution, a civil war, a uh, economic mayhem. What do you call the last 30, 40 years post-Civil War in El Salvador? What do you call that when 3 million Salvadorans flee the country? What do you call that, right? Well, we want to stop that. So where we are going is to the place we want to be. We set in motion. We can choose a different path. And they've chosen a different path. So anybody could follow that model. He, the president of El Salvador himself says that he wants to be like Alexandria. This is Alexandria. You could do the same thing in America. You don't have to have a dilapidated, you know, diseased sort of system falling apart, decay everywhere. You don't need to have that. You can choose to go to a different place. You could choose not to have deaths of despair. You could choose to distribute the wealth differently and stop the Los Doce, stop the 12 banks, like stop this system that has obviously set in motion, uh, you know, a lot of disintegration of the fabric of society. Right. Well, people talk about Bitcoin as being unconfiscatable and censorship resistant. Another word that one can use is incorruptible. And Bitcoin is incorruptible. Mm -hmm. And I think President Bukele recognizes that it's fantastic to have a money as the base layer of your economy that's incorruptible. Uh, and it, uh, the vector is going in the direction that he wants to go. And uh, that, that direction now is attracting the brightest uh, people in El Salvador to work with him. You know, having been in El Salvador, his team that surrounds him, the young politicians and advisors he has are all incredibly smart, enthusiastic. Uh, they're on board with Bitcoin and they want to make El Salvador kind of like the shining city on a hill, the beacon mm. of, of, of freedom in the world, which is a, a place the United States had for a long time. But I think it's decided to just throw the keys to the bankers and the cartels and really turn turn the, turn their back to this idea of freedom. And so it's an open game. And what El Salvador is saying is like, okay, who's going to be the freest country in the world now? It's an open game. Let's let, a, let that be us. Los Doce is what you were talking about, the cartels, when they throw the keys to the cartels. I'll, I'll wrap with this, in, which is I, I tweeted just as we were about to leave El Salvador about these U.S. senators who submitted this thing to the Committee on Foreign Relations, and they're demanding some sort of report on what El Salvador, a sovereign nation who is nobody's backyard, you know, what they get to do with their country, right? So I said, as U.S. senators threaten El Salvador today for daring to take their own decisions on monetary and economic matters, it is worth remembering the past, which was not even past until Bitcoin and Bukele came along. I use an image of Saint 
Oscar Romero. He's now a saint, Oscar Romero. And um, which is a beautiful mural actually right across the street from where he lived in, in San Salvador. So I went there on the last day before we left and took that photo before we flew out. Yeah, it's a remarkable uh, photo. And it's a remarkable place in San Salvador because it's the center of a total urban renewal project. A whole new library is going up. Uh, this downtown is vibrant. There's a lot going on. The Chivo Wallet's got a huge stand set up. People are fully Bitcoin fluent. Uh, meant people in the street I talk to, they know Bitcoin, they love Bitcoin. And uh, I think, you know, putting all the hyperbole aside, it, it just comes down to, to one simple idea. The Bitcoin is incorruptible. El Salvador is adopting Bitcoin uh, and, and the United States is unfortunately become a, uh, just a corrupt cesspool. But the past was not even passed until Bitcoin wrecks, stops, destroys all models and cycles. So the future is already here now because of Bitcoin. I think that's what I'm saying is like that the past it can be over if you choose to go to a different destination that's oh, not stuck. Chills, that's incredible. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, let's go to part two of the interview with the vice president, because here's a man who I could listen to for hours. Don't go away, much more coming. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to return to our conversation with the vice president of El Salvador, Dr. Felix Uoa. Dr. Felix Uoa, welcome back. Thank you, Max. I'm here, still here. That is fantastic. We made <laughs> yeah. it. Yes. <laughs> oh, have you, have you read my book yet? No, but I, I, as you said, <laughs> <laughs> this is a, the new handbook for many of the new economic scholars. You know, uh, Fukuyama, Fukuyama. Uh, Joseph Stiglitz, they have been changing their minds. All the receipts that they presented following the Breadwood the, the Bread Institution, all these concepts, they are, you know, fell apart, and now we are trying to decide new, new ways. The new, new ideas. New ideas, not ideology, but ideas. Uh, the President Bukele has taken very, very, you know, convinced that we are moving in the right way to the future, to the economic freedom, to present our country as a model of a new way to manage the government with the vision of a leader from the 21st century. I mean, whatever was done in the past, whatever was done in the 20th century, that we were part of it, you know, I am a baby boomer, he's a millennial, so our gap in, in, in the age and the generation means, as he used to say, a complementary view of this uh, project. We're, we're both baby boomers. Oh, yeah, we're yeah, we're, 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 we, yeah, we are. I, I told him once, when we were in the, in, in, the, in the closing week, do you remember, on the beach, that it was kind of festival, I said, oh, you weren't born, I was, when the Woodstock Festival, the Woodstock, do you remember? Woodstock. In, the Woodstock in 69. Right. So, were you at Woodstock? Well, I in tried spirit. to go, but, his, but spiritual, I was there. And uh, we took the spirit of freedom. Right. That was a different kind of freedom at that moment. Now I said to him, this is a new version because this is the Woodstock of the 21st century. But anyway. so What, what, what was your favorite band at Woodstock? Uh, well, there were many. Crosby, Steel, Nash & Young. Crosby, Still, Nash & Young. Okay. Of course, the performance of Joe Cocker. Joe with, Cocker, your big Joe Cocker fan. Friend, yeah, okay. He died recently That's in Colorado. I, I wasn't surprised. He was in, living in Colorado, not in England. Uh, but anyway, you yeah, know. Okay, well, let's go back to the past <laughs> for a second. Back. Let's go back to the past for a second. Yeah. Now, as you mentioned, there is a whole history, something to recognize, and then maybe move away from. So your personal history, your father was, or you know, he, he is a hero of El Salvador. Can you tell us about that story? Oh, well, yeah, my father was the president of the National University when the civil war started in the country, and he was uh, killed by the Dede Squad in October uh, 1980. It was an awful year for, for, for El Salvador. Uh, that was the year when he was killed Arbicio Romero, my father that was the president of the National University, the leaders of the FDR, the Revolutionary Democratic Front, the four uh, religious, the Marignol from the United States. I mean, that was, uh, as the, somebody can say, horribulous anus. It means a terrible year 
uh, for the loss that we have in, 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 in the big persons at, at that time. Uh, his legacy has been kept by different institutions worldwide because at the moment when he was killed, he was the president of the World University Service. And actually, he was flying to Geneva, which is the headquarters of this institution, to share uh, the meeting of the World University Service Board. Uh, and I guess that he was killed exactly at that moment because the regime, the military dictatorship at that moment, didn't want him to, to, to speak out in a forum like this uh, at World Wild. Uh, I mean, in, in Geneva was, you know, the many institutions that had, they have the headquarters over there. And my father's one, the World University Service, was ready to receive all the denounces that my father was, you know, collecting for the invasion to the National University, to the campus. The army went there. They took uh, over all the, 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 the schools the law school, the engineering school, all the school, the medicine school. And uh, in addition to the looting of the, the, the goods, the equipment, they burned books of the library. So that was horrible for us. And now, now, recently, a, a part of the media in the opposition here in El Salvador accused Max and Stacy of being economic hitmen. And what you've just described was an example, your father, was the victim of actual economic hitmen. This, this is exactly what John Perkins talks about in his book, Confessions of an e Economic Hitman. So it's ironic, it's also sad that there are still people in this country that don't understand that Bitcoin is offering a path to freedom. What, what is their problem? There, there are two kinds of problems. The, the first of all is they don't understand this movement. They cannot understand it because they get hooked in the past. And the second is because they fear, they fear that their economic interests could be challenged because they are used to be comfortable in the status quo. So when you move the status quo, when you try to move forward, when you try to move uh, in the right way to attend the interests of the population or the people at the large, then you threat or you be become a threat for the small groups, the elite, so overall the economic elite that they hold the power. So we need to be aware that this is a big, big challenge and you are, you know, uh, leading this movement worldwide because we have read uh, your work, not this book that I promise I will read it. But I mean, we are aware about all just the courage that you have shown over those years when you start dealing and challenge all the system. Well, I know one uh, story that I've discovered is completely false, and that is that the country is mired in violence uh, here, and that's completely false. Uh, we came here and walking around San Salvador, it reminds me of Beverly Hills or Santa Monica, California. It's a lovely city, there's vibrancy, there's restaurants are open, the people are out in the streets looking great. Uh, so that was uh, a perception that's completely false. So far, it's completely false. It falls because from the day one, on June the 1st, 2019, the President Bukele put on place the plan which is called Control Territorial, which means try to control or recovering the control of the territory that was in the hand of the gangs. That's why El Salvador was presented all the time as one of the three top violent countries in the world. Because that, because they, the, the gangs, they took over kind of a third of the national territory. Even the revolutionary movement in the civil war couldn't get the control that's now the Well, I lived through something similar in New York City. In the 1970s, yeah, it was yeah. a violent crime, 3,000 murders a year. Uh, it was then decided to, uh, they had a, a policy called uh, broken windows. Oh, yeah, uh, remember where, that. Yeah, everything was uh, basically clamped down and no graffiti, et cetera. So uh, this is what governments uh, have to do occasionally to contend with, uh, with, with violence. And uh, the, I believe the numbers are pretty uh, fantastic in terms of the reduction. Absolutely. And this is one of the achievements of this government. In less than two years, the President Bukele's plan control territorial, get down, absolutely down, the rate of the homicide. We have days 
and weeks with zero homicide. I mean, this is a big achievement. Wow, and I wish Chicago could be so lucky. Oh, yeah. You know, we need to send you to Chicago and wow. teach them how to reduce their violence because I mean, it's absolutely out of control. We are more than willing to share our experiences. By the way, we have been called for different neighbor countries to share our expertise, to share our experience. And the president told me in one case, I, I cannot say which country is this because I'm not allowed to, to, to reveal the name of the country, but the, the president allowed me to go there and share our, our experience in controlling the violence in the urban areas, in the rural areas. I mean, all the wars the, that the gangs are doing, I mean, all these uh, uh, crimes that have been committed <coughs> by the gangs. So I think that this is something that presents our country with one of the most safe countries in the region. Not only uh, on, the, let's say, in public security, but safe also in the legal system. Because this is something that for investors, they want to know which country are they going to, which country are they moving their assets. And Let's talk about investors for a second. So there's a whole new draft of new laws are being introduced to deliver sweeping changes to the economic infrastructure. You are a lawyer. Law is your background. What can you tell us about that? Well, what can I say is that uh, we have a commitment, a strong commitment with the president to strengthen the rule of law in our country. Rule of law for us means, you know, not only the separation of powers, but also implementing the law that are needed to guarantee do economic development, okay, the but human the, rights. The volcano bonds, it's a new asset class, it's a new security, um, and along with those volcano bonds, which my understanding is that they're gonna come along around March 15th, between yeah, March 15th probably, and March yeah. 20th, that there's also a sweeping agenda of dozens of new laws, security laws, and re almost redoing the entire security law infrastructure to accommodate Bitcoin. Is that is that a fair statement, first of all? Yeah. And what, what does that mean? Uh, that means that the scaffolding, legal scaffolding, that we are building now will replace the old one that was based on corruption and, you know, bribing. Uh, I mean, the, the, all the laws were prepared even for evaders, people that they want, they don't like to pay taxes. I mean, those are the guys who built the legal system. And we are now trying to build a new one based on this. First, giving absolutely security to the investors, basically the private sector that needs clear rules and transparency. And also, not only for them, but also preparing a very fair taxation system. Because this is something that you could be surprised. In our fight against corruption, we have the last four president of El Salvador, the last four. Flores was, uh, he died in a trial, in a, he was sued by, for corruption. Saka, he's imprisoned, he was condemned. Funes and Sanchez Seren, they are in Nicaragua because they, they escaped to the justice. So the corruption was one, a big deal, but the four of them, all together, the amount that they are accusing the, in the tribunals is roughly 10, uh, $1,000 million, a billion dollars, the mm -hmm. four of them. But the evaders, the people who they refuse to pay taxes, they evade $2,000 million, $2 billion $2 dollars per year. Right. Right. So the, four, the, the four president was in 20 years, $1 billion. Every year, the government of El Salvador lost $2 billion for evaders. So we are, this is also that we are dealing with, with the new legislation and trying to build a more fair. So you're saying the real criminals are the bankers? The, the bankers are part of it, because the system are, you know, big business, uh, international companies that they prefer to bribe uh, a right. functionary. We have the same problem in the United States. It's, it's, and it's I mean, you mentioned it, all those corrupt politicians it, it, it's, that it's, it's are in the past. I think after the Durham report in the United States, we'll probably be surpassing you in terms of politicians in jail. Well, uh, this is something that we hope that one day, I mean, we will change the culture because this is a, a culture. I mean, uh, we have to deal with, the, you know, the, these parameters that make the, for the youth. Uh, that the models are, oh, this guy, he was poor, 
uh, uh, when he was living in a very poor neighborhood, but then he became MP or he became a politician, he got elected, and now he lives in a very fancy mansion or a fancy house. So that model we have to to deal with because it's cultural, the problem. All right, Corruption we got to cut it the up culture. there. We're with you. And from one boomer to another, thank you so much for being on Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. It is a real pleasure. And, you know, my, my regards and my greetings and all my, with the bottom of my heart for your audience and for the people that are supporting this project. And we promise that we will never fail. We will move forward. And with the leadership of the President Bukele, we will succeed. Awesome. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. Once again, a very special thank you to our guest, Vice President of El Salvador, Dr. Felix Uowa. Thank you. Thank you. Till next time. Bye, y'all.